Should we have a warm round of applause and a welcome to the stage then for Pierre? Okay. Thank you, Pierre. Okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. Welcome. Thank you. Okay. Uh, welcome from me to your uh, Flickr advisors. Here. Good. Okay. Uh, I'll wait a minute to see if other people come back from the break. So uh, I'm going to talk about different subjects. I'm going to talk about uh, um, our company, Hexaskin Editor. Then I'm going to talk about uh, why we started, uh, the challenges for AI and big data in healthcare, um, and, and all we need to put in place so that we can automate healthcare services and wellness services. Then I'm going to talk about a, a few projects that we've worked on at Hexaskin uh, with our technology. And uh, hopefully, this is going to be interesting for you. So Exoskin is a connected health company. We're known for our smart clothing product. So some people think we're a clothing company, like Nike, Nike or Under Armour. We're actually more of a software company. Most of our employees write code you know, on a daily basis. So we're mostly a software company with a, an interesting hardware component. Uh, it just happened that we, we, we make really good hardware and good sensors. Uh, but the, the goal, our goal, is to measure personal, personal health and make the information available and useful. So these shirts measure a bunch of things. Uh, the shirts we have on the market today measure ECG, heart rate variability, uh, breathing. It's actually the only product in the world that can measure ventilation in a non-invasive way today. Uh, it also measures activity and all that. It has an API where open data, so if you're interested in using our sensors in your application and your projects, this is, this is a possibility. So we, we started the company 10 years ago. And uh, we had a background in telecommunication, semiconductors, uh, signal processing, and machine learning. And we saw the state of machine learning, and we we saw that all the people at the time in machine learning were going through to either finance, so Wall Street, or online advertising at Google and Yahoo. And we said, well, this is, this is really good maths. We should be able to apply it for something that's really good for society. We should apply it for, to healthcare because there are so many needs, there's so much things we need to do because the population in aging is aging and the costs are, are going up. So, and we thought that if we had this digital version of the patient, we could do operation on it and, and provide a bunch of services uh, that people, people have talked about yesterday and today. Um, and th this is a big deal. This is a big deal because healthcare is such an important part of our economy. You know, 25 years ago in the US, in most states, the biggest industry, the biggest employer was manufacturing. Today, in 2016, in most states, the biggest industry is healthcare. So it's very labor intensive too. So, and what, what we're good for you know, in computing is automate uh, thought processes and automate you know, services and labor. So th th there's a huge opportunity here. But w what is the current state of affairs? So we started in 2006 and we said, Great, we're going to apply all we know uh, from machine learning to healthcare. And then we got to hospitals, and then we discovered that all the data was on paper. So it, it's really hard to train a neural network when the data is on paper. So, and and th that's, just, that's just one of the problems. Even the data we had, it was very sparse, not accessible in different databases when it's digital, uh, and there, there are you know, a thousand hurdles in getting access to this data uh, to, um, to, to do machine learning. One thing we've even seen in hospitals is they say, well, we have an electronic health record, and what they really have is doctor's notes scanned, and it's a TIFF image file that you have in a database. So it's really hard, it's really hard to work in that context. And anyway, we wanted to have uh, data about people not when they're sick and at the hospital. We wanted to have clinical grade data when uh, they live their own life. And right now, you know, what we've seen is that the sensors we have, we have access to 
look like this. So on the left side, you have a Holter ECG monitor, state of the art. That's, that's what is being used today. And on the right, that's a polysomnography system. So it's, as you can see, this is not something you would like to use 30, uh, 365 days a, uh, a year. So how do we get the data uh, that we need to, to do AI in healthcare? Um, well, you need to record data, transmit it, process it, make it available. You, we have a few devices today uh, that are available, but it's, it's still very early uh, for uh, consumer devices with clinical grade data. And even you know, consumer wearables in general. Think about it, five years ago, the only real mass product you had on the market was the first version of Fitbit. And it was not even wireless. You needed to, to charge it on a duck st ducking station uh, to get the data from it. It was the first version with the flower uh, that you can see at the bottom here. So it's been only five years, really, that, that the consumer has access to personal health and wellness data that is measured automatically by devices they wear. Um, so so we, we've looked at it and we said, OK, so, so it's really hard to get data. Uh, we want to do machine learning. How do we proceed? We need a roadmap. So that's more or less the roadmap that we've defined uh, at the time and that we still follow today. So we need to be able to record the information in real life settings. It needs to be clinical grade. We need to transmit the information. So connectivity is very important. Then we'll be able to do reporting, forecasting, and build automated health services and AI, which is the end game of all of this. And when we get there, we'll be able to provide people anywhere in the world 24-7 automated healthcare services. But we're really far from it today in 2016. Where we are right now, I, I believe, is between one and two. We, we can record uh, clinical grade information from people, but in most cases, it's not even transmitted. So for example, there, there's a company here called, uh, uh, that makes, well, I'm not going to say the name, they're, they're, they just filed for the IPO and they make an ECG patch. It's very interesting, well, you know what, the one I'm talking about. But the, even their product, which is very innovative, if the patient uses it for a week, they need to mail the device to the company. It's still not connected in 2016. And we're talking uh, about a, a startup company that had access to uh, a capital in nine figures. So we're still far from it, so, but we're, we're working on it. So, uh, the, and the way we see the sensors, there are some design goals that we've set for ourselves. Um, a very smart person that works in wearables said, if you do wearables, they need to be either fashionable or invisible. Uh, he went for fashionable, we went for invisible. So for example, right now, I'm wearing one of our smart shirts under uh, my dress shirt. And my smart shirt is recording my ECG, the way I breathe, my breathing patterns, the way I move. And my smart shirts transmit the information to my smartphone, which transmits the information to my account in the cloud. And I can give access to this information to anybody in the world with an internet connection. So I could have a trainer or a doctor in South Africa or in Japan following my vital signs right now in real time while I'm, I'm giving my talk. So as you can see, so it's invisible. It's very discreet. And we think it's very important when you design an object and you're going to give it to someone with chronic, a chronic disease uh, that it shouldn't make the person uh, aware of it, or to, to, it shouldn't force the person to show other people that they monitor themselves. So it needs to be very discreet. So now I'm going to, to talk about a few projects that we've worked on. So one of the, these projects is an at-home cardiac rehabilitation program. So our uh, Connected health platform and smart shirts allow the clinicians to assess patient compliance and to monitor the patient, get the ECG, but also get the activity level. And cardiologists have told us that this is very important for, for them, and it, it, it looks 
It looks like it's not a big deal, but it is a big deal for them. Because for the first time, in addition to an ECG, they know how much the person was active in a day. So if they see your heart rate is 120, they actually see if you've been walking or if you've been sitting since half an hour. If your heart rate is 120, you know, knowing if you were moving or not gives a very different meaning to this data. So this context is very interesting for them. Our smart shirts are machine washable, so people can use them for months. Uh, so it's a solution for long-term monitoring. And not long-term, like halter, ECG, 24 hours uh, long-term, which is you know, what they call long-term today. But we're really talking long-term as months so that the patients who are 80 years old who don't necessarily have a driver's license don't have to go back to the hospital all the time. And they can benefit from telemedicine services and the clinicians who follow them still have access to all the data. So uh, by the way, this is some work that we've done with the Montreal Heart Institute. And we're working with other hospitals too, uh, setting up these programs. Uh, another thing that we do that's pretty unique is um, our shirts have two breathing sensors that uh, allow uh, clinicians to assess breathing patterns, breathing rate, but also ventilation. So this is the only product in the world that can assess lung function continuously in the long term. So we're currently uh, running uh, clinical trials to define new standards of care for people with respiratory diseases so that we can go from the you know, one use of spirometry in the doctor's office and you, can, you, get, you get one data point and then you prescribe everything based on that to a continuous measurement of lung function, uh, the measurement of the number of exacerbation and the number of times basically that the, the people get in, in, in crisis with their disease. So this has a lot of application, 300 million COPD patients in the world and this is going to grow uh, in the next uh, 20 years, uh, sadly, but it's going to grow. Uh, another project that we've been working on is sleep monitoring at home. And I, I think this is very interesting. And you know, look at the bottom of the image. Uh, I say it's a 19 minute setup by a technician. And these numbers are real, and I've verified them in many countries. So if you go to a sleep clinic and you want to get a sleep assessment, there's a technician that is going to glue sensors on you and put wires on you for 90 minutes. And you're going to sleep in a bed that is not your bed, in a room that's not your room. And they're going to tell you, well, I'm going to be behind that window looking at you all night. So try to sleep normally, because we're going to base our diagnostics based on, on this. You know. So it's a very artificial sleep environment. Uh, you know, in contrast, we offer a solution where you can sleep at home in your own bed with your family, and you can track sleep over the long term. So you can differentiate, for example, between a weekday and a weekend day, and you can, uh, you can track your sleep throughout uh, the year. So if you have, uh, well, sleep disorders, you can see patterns of what affects the quality of your sleep over time, but in a way that's very precise. Uh, you know, with clinical grade sensors. Uh, so, and this is work that we've done. Uh, well, we were working with many organizations for that, but including uh, hospitals in Montreal, the University of Montreal, and the uh, US Navy Medicine in San Diego. And, uh, well, finally, uh, something that we're very proud of is that we've been working with the Canadian Space Agency and other space agencies since 2011 to build. Um, a space medicine system for long-term space mission. And we've announced last month uh, that our connected health system and uh, wearable sensors are going to fly in the International Space Station in two years. So we're working with uh, you know, the Johnson Space Center in Houston, NASA Ames in Mountain View here, and the Canadian Space Agency uh, to, to, to put in place all the technology they need in the short term to study physiology in space, but also to build the autonomous space medicine system that will be used for future missions to the moon and to Mars and beyond. So we're, it's very exciting. Um, yeah, so that, that's what we do at Hexos Skin. Thank you, thank you for staying here for the, the end of the day. And if you have questions, I'm available now.
Hey, so I'd like to say <laughs> thank you again. Thank you. <laughs> I'm surprised I didn't recognize you when you were sitting over here. So we say hello for uh, the first I time. I was standing at the right place. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Anyway, we'll turn to uh, questions. So let's see if the, uh, the audience has some. It's like that Friday feeling. I can sense it. I'm sure it's not just me. It's Tuesday. Uh, Jana, <laughs> did I get it right that time? Yeah, that actually was correct. Uh, I was at the wearable technology conference over in July, and there was another company also had a wearable shirt, but they analyzed sweat, and from that they got things like um, glucose and things like that. Does Hexoskin at all think about analyzing or adding those types of sensors into their product? Well, we, we'd love to monitor sweat and glucose in a non-invasive way. Uh, but as far as we know, um, the technology is not ready yet uh, to be mass produced. Uh, so well, if, if you know something I don't know, I'd love to talk after, after this. I can't help but ask a typical, I'll call it Lee question, but do you think it'll become mainstream that we wear smart clothing? And if so, within how many years? Well, it, it's a good question. I think right now, the way we make smart clothing, uh, it has some constraint. Uh, the, 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 the clothing needs to be fitted. So it's good if you like spandex and if you like, uh, you know, tight Do underwear. Do you like spandex? Well, I, I, I'm OK with okay, it. OK, you're OK with it. I, I think it, it's going to have a lot of application for people with chronic diseases or in certain contexts. So we work, you know, we work over the, the whole spectrum of health, from Olympic athletes, astronauts, and professional athletes who are very healthy in general, to uh, the chronically ill, you know, 80-year-old COPD patient, chronic heart failure patient, and everything in between. But I, I don't think it's for everybody now. And, it's probably the case for all wearables today. It's still a minority of the population that use them. You think them. within a decade we'll all have smart clothing, sensor-laced clothing? Within a decade? Within a decade, <laughs> like 2026. 20, no, I don't think we'll have, I don't think all of us need that. No, personally, no. The thing is, why? Why, why would we have Well, this? personally, I think so. Mm -hmm. which will make you happy. Yeah, well, I, got more I, I like... Sell. And the reason I think so is because I think the not being integrated permanently with sensors will be like today's equivalent of being a smoker. If you take the computing off, then you've got no data capture. If you don't have data capture, then your longevity is automatically going down and you're making other less suboptimal life choices. I could be wrong. We have the video being well, made. I, People I, will be able I, I to like, on YouTube. You know, I like the <laughs> optimism in the room, and I think it's growing, going to grow very fast. But we're still very small. So like, uh, our company can triple in size for 10 years, and we'll still be you know, in, in, a, in a place where not everybody has sensors. You know, even now, I meet people on a regular basis who don't know what a Fitbit is. You know, so if you get out of Silicon Valley, you realize that these IDs and this technology is a lot less mainstream than we think it is. Okay, Kevin and then Victor has a question. Uh, I'm enthusiastic about the smart clothing, but I still wonder whether they've worked out the manufacturing issues. You're putting electronics within a, a, a cloth garment that will go through a washing system. Uh, how many washes are these good for, and how do you see that uh, improving over time? <laughs> Well, we, with our products, we made the electronics so that you can separate them from the shirt. So the sensors stay in the shirt, but the, the electronics and the battery separate from the shirt. And th it has two advantages. First is that you don't need to make all the electronics and the battery washable. It's just the shirts that are washable. And two, you can only buy, you can buy the electronics only once, and you can have multiple shirts. So it reduced the overall cost of long-term use uh, that way. No? Oh. Um, are you planning on having posture sensors as also, or is that a com something you haven't considered? Well, well, we're working on other sensors, but our company focuses on vital science sensors. So for example, we have uh, 
we have another version of the shirt that has a multi-lead ECG, uh, pulse oximetry, continuous blood pressure measurements, uh, temperature measurements, so a complete stack of vital signs measurements. But, but as of today, we're not focusing on movement or movement of the limbs or other musculoskeletic uh, problems. So biofeedback. So, well, we have users who use our technology for biofeedback, especially since we have the breathing sensors. We've talked a lot of, about the importance of breathing and mild, mindfulness in the past uh, two days. Uh, so there's a screen in our app that shows you how you're breathing. And for a lot of people, it helps them be aware uh, of this. And it, it, you know, one, one of the things that we've seen in, in biofeedback and neuropsychology is that even if they do a lot of work with EEG biofeedback, they get most of the results by teaching people how to breathe. And th what they see with people with, who are deep into depression, for example, is that they, it really helps them to have this technological uh, aid to learn how to breathe. So you know, that's the, the, the feedback uh, part we have here. Thank you, Pierre. Thank you. Appreciate it again. Thank you.